Hello, how y'all doing? Glad to be here. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? That's what's up. I'm excited, excited. Been uh, coming in different years to campus outreach. I'd like to give a big shout out to the campus outreach staff and team. Let's give God a hand praise for them. All right. Well, let's dig in. I want you to turn your Bibles for me uh, over to John, the sixth chapter, verses 60 through 71. John, the sixth chapter, verses 60 through 61. Why don't you stand to your feet? I'm old school, so I'm going to read the Bible a little bit. And um, I'm going to read these verses for us so that we can be on one accord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to set my timer for myself. There we go. All right. There we go. So, I'm reading from the CSB version of the Bible. It says, therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, asked him, does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. And Jesus says to the 12, you don't want to, you want to go away also? And Simon said to him, Lord, whom will, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. I want to talk about this morning how to fight and avoid the fall. How to fight and avoid the fall. Lord God, I pray over these students that are in here today that you would uh, shepherd and lead them by your spirit. Lead us by your spirit. And God, I pray today that the words of uh, my mouth and the meditations of our heart uh, may be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our strength in our Redeemer in whom we trust. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody can read that said? Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. During the pandemic, um, 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 I, 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 I gained some pounds and ended up, you know, just, you know, wilding out on my eating and ended up uh, getting down 30 pounds. And so I got down 30 pounds after the pandemic. And so praise the Lord for that. Still working on that. <laughs> but, but, but still, but, 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 it, but, but during the pandemic, one of the things that got me in trouble was Wingstop. Um, yeah, Wingstop is a problem. And, uh, 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 and one day I went into Wingstop as usual and because I like to go in to make sure my order is right. You know, I don't know about y'all, but I want to make sure all my stuff is where it's supposed to be because I don't want to get home with blue cheese. I need that ranch from Wingstop. A to the doggone men, everybody in the church. And so, and so as I go in, um, it's pretty chaotic at this time. Um, the person that is in there uh, managing the time is literally cussing the staff out. I mean, it, it, I mean, th there was no order. The, she was asking the fry person to jump and get the wings. She was asking the wing person, to, or, or the, the, the person that was saucing the wings, to come up and answer the phone. I mean, it, it, was, it was chaos and disorder. And at one point, she just tells them, close the door and, and don't let anybody else in until we get everything right. And it was unbelievable. It was an unbelievable time. It was chaotic. And when I looked at um, the staff and I looked in their eyes, I could see the embarrassment and I could see the pain and the frustration in their eyes um, from what they were experiencing. And as I was looking at that uh, pain in their eyes, I realized one thing in particular was lacking in that wing stop, and it was leadership and structure. Somebody say leadership and structure. 
Those two things were missing in there because if I was the manager, I'm, I've never managed a, a, a food spot before, but I would have the people that were specifically for the sauces, the people were specifically for packing, the people for specifically to talk to people to make sure they got their order, the people specifically on the phone and the internet, uh, getting, the, getting the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tracking in, have somebody on the cash register, making sure everybody's getting cashed out, you feel me? I'd have everybody, whoever's on the fryer, they'd be on the fryer. I had that thing organized and they would be passing things around in an organized way. And many times as I thought about that situation, I've seen being a disciple and what it means to be a disciple in the church to be one of the most confusing things. Many churches and many ministries in our world and, and, and many of our lives are walking in that type of chaos and confusion, not knowing how to work and how things are to go. But we are in a time period, family of God, where we need robust, stout men and women who are absolutely unadulteratedly sold out for Jesus Christ and who are clear and committed to what it means to be a robust beast for the Lord God Almighty in the earth that we live in. But we have to be able to work through some of our challenges. Listen, it's very important in working through those challenges. One of the biggest things that we need today more than ever is clarity. Somebody say clarity. And the reason why we need clarity is we need to have the brand of Christianity, I would say, rebranded to the world. If you ask the average Christian, you know, what is our mission as Christians? I wonder what we know. If we ask, what are, what's our product that we're promoting and putting out they, they, many wouldn't know. Who, who are your customers? Who are you trying to engage, family? And what qualities is this brand of the kingdom? What, what, what are the kingdom nutrients that we are supposed to reflect in every area of our life? So we're supposed to know the churches and, the, and our individual purpose and mission. We're supposed to know whom we represent. We're supposed to know what we're trying to accomplish. We should be clear on it. We, we want to, we should know what spells a win. We should know what does our target, how do they perceive us in the world? We have a lot of work to do in working through those realities. And so Jesus Christ in this passage is training his disciples. And one of the things that he does is Jesus always puts you in a situation, always, for you to rethink your life, always. If, if, you, if you're Christian long enough, Jesus is gonna allow you to be put in a situation to where he causes you to rethink your life. So in John 6, it's one of the sick one now passages of the Gospels where Jesus is just fed the 5,000. The problem with many of us is we don't realize that when Jesus does a miracle, it's not for you to see the miracle, it's for you to see him. If you walk away without seeing Jesus, you just experience a magic trick, not a transformation. And so, and so Jesus wants them to have a stout amount of clarity on this, and he specifically on purpose <coughs> allows them to get in a situation where they understand, recognize, and know that you are being tested as a disciple and you're gonna be clear on what a disciple is and he will give you a chance to make the choice. What is a disciple? A disciple of Jesus, hear me, is one who has renounced himself or herself and pledged their life to being in a lifetime apprenticeship to Jesus Christ. Hear me again. A disciple of Jesus is one who has renounced him or herself and pledged their life to being in a lifetime apprenticeship to Jesus Christ. In other words, you never stop learning. Uh, if, 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 you got, if you got baby soft skin from birth all the way to varicose veins, you never stop learning and being apprenticed to Jesus Christ until you close your eyes in time and you go into eternity. Uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says it beautifully in his passage, uh, in his book. He, he, say, he says, a, a, a call discipleship is a call to die. And so I got one point and one point only in fighting the fall. 
in fighting the fall as a disciple. Number one and only point. Being a disciple in fighting the fall, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is an invitation to emancipation, not an introduction to a prison. Let me say that again. <clears throat> being a disciple of Jesus is an invitation to emancipation, not a prison. Let, let, let's look at verse 60. It says, therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they, they said, this teaching is hard. What did they hear in the passage? They heard that Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Now, that sounds like some old crazy talk. Um, but Jesus Christ, in the beauty of what he does, is he always speaks spiritual words to you to see if you will have a fleshly response to it versus a spiritual response to it. Let me say it again. He wants to see if you'll have a spiritual response versus a fleshly response. And so as he, so, so, so when his disciples heard it, they, 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 were, they were being challenged by what Jesus Christ is saying. And they said, Jesus, this teaching is hard. They found it hard to understand. And they said, hard, hard, hard to even connect with. And as he walks with them through this, we must recognize that there will be times where we have to face hard teachings. We're in a society where people are abandoning the faith by the droves. You, you, you see a lot of apostasy. You can't pull up TikTok where there isn't a lot of skepticism. You probably, being on a college campus, you probably hear more skepticism <coughs> than, 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 you, than you'd like to hear in a day. But we live in a society of a high level of inf information access and a high level of ignorance. And in living in that society of that high level of information but ignorance, people think they know everything because they're getting attached to information, but they're not getting connected to truth. So what does Jesus do here? He gives them a hard saying on purpose, hard teachings that we as believers have to embrace as believers. Jesus is going to allow you to experience some hard teachings. One, one, one of those hard teachings uh, uh, practically in our lives is a theology of suffering. It's a part of the fall that we've experienced. One of the hardest things for us as believers to wrap our minds around is a theology of suffering. The Bible says that he or she that walks godly in Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. Listen, these, when Jesus makes hard statements, and not just hard statements, he will put you in hard situations that make you decide, are you going to walk with me or not? My wife, um, my wife, uh, 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 of, of, we just uh, experienced and, and, and enjoyed celebrating 25 years of marriage last December. And, 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 I, and I can tell you, uh, by the grace of God, God has been with us through marriage. But, 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 but God had to let us know that marriage isn't a sexcapade, it's an eternal ministry. Okay, ain't nobody going to talk back to me to... The Pentecostal people to talk back to me. It's all right. It's all right. You feel me. You know, you know, you know. It's not a sex campaign. It's a ministry. And God would allow and do things in it to remind you that it's more than just for your personal preferences, but he wants to root you in his biblical principles. And so one of the things that happened is my wife, we lost our first child. She'd been 23 years old this month. She was stillborn. Um, my wife had two liver transplants. She had six bouts with cancer last fall. She had two rounds of chemo. And when you walk with God and you deal with that many times of things that God allows in your life, it's times where you're either going to let it draw you closer to Jesus Christ because the fall is still in effect in the world. So just because you got saved doesn't mean the fall won't touch you. That's very important. The, the, the fall will still touch you, but the test isn't whether or not the fall will still touch you. The, 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 the question is, are you going to say, God, I still trust you? That's the key to it. And so Jesus Christ nurtures our lives and works our lives to help us to recognize, listen, that in the chaos of your experience, I'm up to something. Somebody say, I'm up to something. 
You have to understand, many of you may have had some trauma in your past. You may have some trauma now, or you have some, something that you maybe are going to experience. But I'm letting you know right now that all of these curves and all of these detours and all of these frustrations and all of your broken hearts and all of your suffering and all of your, I don't understand God, all of your, I can't hear you, God. God, do you hear me? God, do you see me? God, do you understand what I'm going through? Are all ways in which God is nurturing and working on your heart and delivering to you some of the greatest nutrients of your soul, but you won't see the results unless you walk, to, walk with them even when you don't understand. The disciples are being tested here. And Jesus is literally putting them in a situation to say to them, will you walk with me even when you don't understand everything that I'm telling you and allowing in your life. And so, I mean, God, has, he got some hard teachings. Love your enemies. I don't like that one. That's a hard teaching, right? Let the Lord fight your battle. Some of us scrappy-doo, like all Scooby-Doo, we want to knock somebody clean out on our own, right? Some of us have the gift of slappage, right? But that's a hard teaching to know you can whoop somebody, but say, I got to wait on God to whoop them for me. That's, that's, that take the Holy Ghost all up in every vein in your life. A to the doggone men. Why is hard teaching important? Why is hard teaching important? It helps you trust Jesus. It's number one. It exposes where you are on your journey with Jesus. So it helps you trust Jesus. It exposes you where you are on your journey with Jesus. But listen to the last thing. It confronts your personal values with God's. In other words, what do you value? Your, uh, one of the parts of the sanctification process in the conformity to Jesus' image is our values colliding with God's values. When the children of Israel came up out of Persia, out of captivity, and when they came out, um, they, 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 you know, they, was, they started building the temple, then they stopped, then they started building out fly cribs. They started getting cedar and building out fly. If it was the equivalent, I don't know if y'all, y'all may be too young, but it'd have been like MTV Cribs type cribs. You understand what I'm saying? And some of y'all might not even remember that. You may be too young, but you don't understand what I'm saying. But listen, so it's like TVs coming out of, your, your, you know, your, your, your kitchen table with the granite on it. And it's, it's your chandeliers everywhere. I mean, they, I mean, Israel was making their house super fly, right? And, but God said to them, he said, will you build your house while my house lies desolate? Why? God's house in the Old Testament, in, in its physical form, represented uh, Israel being committed to being a kingdom of priests, of showing God's glory to the earth. And so he says, will you prioritize your own personal preferences above my own biblical principles? Whenever God tells you something hard, he's trying to help you to, to, to pursue his purposes in your life, but also to nurture them into your life. Look at verse 61. Jesus, knowing in himself, I like that, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling. You know, they were grumbling. You know, when they knew enough. They were walking with Jesus long enough to know not to say certain things out loud. You know, when you've been in the church long enough, it's stuff that you think, but you won't say, right? So, so he knows they're grumbling in their hearts about what he said, right? And he said, does this offend you? He said, does this offend you? So Jesus asked a key question because they were thinking on a fleshly plane and not entrusting themselves to him to fully, uh, 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 themselves to him fully uh, uh, and didn't press in to learn what Jesus wanted them to learn. Verse 62, this is dope. It says, then what if I, what if you were to observe the son of man ascending to where he was before. This is amazing. So now he, like, it not only did he tell them something that had them confused in the first place, he further tells them something that they're confused about. So, so he's saying where he ascended, he said he was born in, he was born in Bethlehem. Oh, he didn't ascend from nowhere. He was, in, uh, he was in a cave in a manger, right? But Jesus isn't talking about, Jesus is talking about ascending to where he went in his eternal existence. In other words, Jesus says, if you won't press in with me as I 
uh, 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 tell you and you experience hard things, you won't grow and develop in the other things that I want to make clear to you in life. And so one of the things that you'll learn as you walk with the Lord is that your uh, walk with Jesus Christ is a constant working of illumination. It, the revelation is already written, but it's a constant disposition where Jesus Christ is opening up and illuminating our minds with more truth and more ideologies that come from the beauty of the nectar of heaven. Verse 63, it said, he says, the spirit is the one. He starts talking in code to them because he wants to pull them into learning how to think spiritually versus fleshly. Stay with me. He says in 63, he says, the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh does not help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and, the, and their life. It's the same thing he said to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, how can you be born again? He said, you a teacher of Israel and you don't even know what the heck I'm talking about because if you was a teacher of Israel, you see you thinking fleshly because you thinking that I'm going into the mama's womb again, but he's talking about, I'm talking about spirit, uh, spirit uh, uh, birth. In other words, being reborn. If you go over to Ezekiel chapter 25 verses, uh, 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 34 verses, uh, 25 through 20, uh, 27, you would have known that I cause, I sprinkle you clean with water, cause you to be born again, take the old spirit out, put a new spirit in, take the old heart out, stone out, put a new heart in. You would have known what I was talking about if you were thinking spiritually. That's what he tells him. And so when, 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 when God is calling us to think spiritual, we got everybody out here, they say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. You know, I don't know if you heard that before, right? But we have to understand, is spiritual without God is witchcraft. To be spiritual without our God is witchcraft. What do I mean? Because when, why is witchcraft wrong? Witchcraft is wrong because it gives you illegitimate access to the spirit realm. And so what happens when you get illegitimate access? When you get illegitimate access to the spirit realm, it opens up to the door with uncontrollable entities that will enter your life and cause even more confusion than you're already in. But when, that's why Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. What's that? I'm the door to the spirit realm. So getting born again is to have authentic access to the spirit realm with Jesus being the one that controls what comes towards you. That's why those things are wrong. So that's why we listen to him. So we're not just spiritual. We are transformed by the spirit. He said flesh does not, he said the flesh does not help at all. He says, the word that I've spoken are spirit and life. And it goes back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. I love this. He says, now we have not received, I love this, the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God. He said, we also speak in verse 13, things not in words taught by human wisdom, listen, but in those taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. I love verse 15. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate or judge everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. So what does it mean to be spiritual in the Bible? It means to be connected to God. It's number one. Spiritual needs, means to be connected to God. That's the current verse. It also means to be born by the Holy Spirit, John chapter 3. But it also <clears throat> means to have legitimate access to the spirit realm, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. And so why is all of this important? It's because in order to avoid these falls, you have to have a Christian worldview. Somebody say Christian worldview. This is important. What is a Christian worldview? <clears throat> a Christian worldview, Christian worldview is a grid that people who know Jesus <clears throat> Christ are to develop from the Bible on how they interact, how they, act, I'm sorry, how they look at, interact with, and understand God, people, life, and decision making. Let me say that again. A Christian worldview is a grid that people who know Jesus Christ are to develop from the Bible on how they look at, interact with, and understand God, people, life, and decision-making. You can put 1 Corinthians 
2, 14 through 16 beside that. Let me see if I can make it plain. Um, I, how many of y'all look at TikTok and stuff and y'all see those life hacks? You ever seen a life hack? Uh, 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 one of those life hacks is just something around the house that you didn't know could be used for something else. So, uh, so I'm watching this TikTok video, and um, th th this, um, this person said, uh, ran the water in the shower and everything looked nice and clean. <clears throat> but all of a sudden, they said, let me show you a life hack. They took, some, they took some, a Ziploc bag, took some water, put some type of solution in it, a, a cleaning solution, and they put it a, around the shower head, and then they, they rubber banded there and held it there for 24 hours. When they held it there for 24 hours, they went back the next day and looked in there, and the water was murky. The water, listen, and nothing ran. It was just stuff running into it, and there was things swimming around in it. In other words, without using that life hack to, to funnel through what was in there, they wouldn't have known the mess that was pouring onto them if they didn't do that life hack. The Bible is your grid that you use as a strain to keep the world's mess out of your life. And so that's what we're supposed to do as believers as we work through and challenge what it means to use a worldview, a biblical worldview. And so in this world that we're in, this is how you're avoiding the fall with the biblical worldview, using your Christian worldview. You use it on gender issues. You use it on sex and sexuality. You use it on roles. You use it on justice. You use it on child rearing. You use it on purpose, and you use it on creation. You use it on every single thing in your life. Verse 64, it says, but there are some among you who don't believe. This is crazy. It said, for Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. And so Jesus lets them know that people can agree with certain concepts that Jesus communicates, feel the vibe of worship even. You know, I like the vibe of worship. They may even lift their hands, but they only agree with what they value. What do I mean by that? As long as I value what I'm experiencing, I'll remain in what's called Christianity. But functionally, if anything rubs me the wrong way, I'm out this joint. I, I'm saying bye to you, holla at you later, arriva jerchi, I'm out. But they're not wanting their values to become informed and shaped by Jesus because they have they don't have him or his spirit. There are people in churches and there are people in this room right now that may not even believe. In many ways, you are just trying God. Okay, let me see if I can make a plan. Um, when I go to King of Prussia Mall, um, you know, I, I go past the food court. And I always like when the people are giving out food samples. I don't even know if you ever went by the food samples. And you know, usually, you, you don't want to let them know that you're not going to buy nothing. But you just want a sample. So what you try to do is act like you're looking, you know. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to get it. And you kind of back up and look like that. And they said, try a sample, try a sample. I said, okay. And then I, I get a sample. And then, you know, I get the sample. And then I go to another spot, do the same thing. You know, act like I'm looking, get another sample. And I, I do all of that. And because what? The, the reason why I'm doing that is because I want a sample, not a full meal. Many people want a piece of Jesus. They don't want all of Jesus. They want a piece of Christianity, not all of what God has to give. They don't want, they want a piece of the Bible. God is love, but they don't want the rest of the Bible. And so what ends up happening is Jesus begins to keep pouring on them everything that he wanted, and what happened after this is that and many no longer walked with him anymore. And so some walked away at this point. And as they walked away at this point, which is crazy, Jesus, it, most people think of Jesus <coughs> as this guy that's begging people to walk with him and stay with him. Jesus doesn't beg anybody to be a disciple. He opens up the door of discipleship and opens up the opportunity for us to walk with him and opens up the opportunity for us to live for him and be absolutely committed to him. But then Peter says, where are we to go for you are the one with the words to eternal life? And then he remains around. And as he remains around, he remains around wondering what it's going to be like to walk with Jesus. And so I'm going to let you know that walking in Jesus is sometimes you know what's going on and sometimes you don't know what's going on. And you have to be okay with that and not allow 
Your feelings about what you don't know that's going on cause you to walk away from Jesus in a fall like Adam and Eve and so many others. Why is this important? Because you have to know that you're walking the journey of the beautiful mystery, but God, listen, in every season of confusion, God is up to something. I'm closing here. Listen to me. One of my favorite movies from the 80s is The Karate Kid. I love The Karate Kid. My, that's one of my favorite, favorite all-time movies. I'm a sucker for the bully movies. Where you, somebody got bullied and they, they can whoop the bully later on in the movie. I love revenge movies. I'm sorry. Pray for me. And so um, in this particular part, uh, you know, uh, Daniel Sand is going to learn from Mr. Miyagi. And, you know, he tells him, sand the floor. And he sands the floor and he sands the fence and he sands the fence. And he said, when am I going to learn karate? He said, Daniel Sand, no, no, no. Paint fence, paint fence, go paint fence. And he's painting the fence and he does all he, and then he gets to the car. He said, when are we going to learn karate? He comes the next day. He goes there. He starts working on the car. And he said, go, go, get your right. Good, good, Daniel Sand. Good. And Daniel Sand does it. And then Daniel Sand looks around and Mr. Miyagi looking real fly with all the work that Daniel Sand did around his crib, right? But, 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 but Daniel Sand finally went to him and ended up telling him, when are you going to teach karate? He said, Daniel son already know karate. He said, show me paint the fence. He said, boom, boom. He's like, oh. He said, show me wax on, wax off. He said, boom, wax on, boom, wax on, boom. He started doing all of these different things. Let me show me paint the floor. He said, boom, and boom, and, and, and they were fighting. And he said, do it real fast. Boom, 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 boom. Then Daniel did like that. He was like, I be God dog. Because what happened, Daniel didn't know that the things that his master was taking him through was teaching him lessons of life and to fight. So as fall opportunities come to you, I want you to continue to walk with Jesus and trust his heart even when you can't see his hand. In Jesus' name, amen.